So Kate, as you know, your book brought me to tears, Maddie's story as well. Um, it's such an important read. Can you tell us about Madison? Yeah, so Madison Holleran was a young woman who grew up in Allendale, New Jersey. She was a soccer star, track star, big family, loving family. She went to the University of Pennsylvania to run track and cross country, and this was in 2013, the fall of 2013. And that transition to college became the downfall for her. She fell into anxiety and what her parents now think was depression. And she went back for her second semester of that freshman year and she died by suicide about eight days into that second semester. So um, that was the story and the headlines right after that happened were the first time I noticed it and when we at ESPN were like, that's a story that we feel is we need to take a, a dive on and, and unearth. And why was this story for important, so important for you in particular to tell? Yeah, I mean, so if I'm totally transparent in the beginning is uh, I'm a journalist, I'm a storyteller, and I was compelled by the story. It, it didn't start with, I think this is important and I need to do good for the world. It was, I'm compelled to learn more about what happened to Madison Holleran, and I think other people will be compelled as well. So that was the key foundational piece. And as I read more and learned more, talked to her family, talked to her friends, I realized we had a lot of overlap in our stories. My sister had run cross country and track at Dartmouth, and I had always noticed a kind of personality type that was pervasive within that community. Yep. I played hoops at the University of Colorado and really struggled my freshman year. I had lived in Philly, so all of a sudden I was like, I have a lot of touchstones with this story. And so as we did that magazine piece, and then the reaction to that piece, that was the moment in the reaction to that piece where I was like, this is about more than journalism and storytelling. This is about expanding this and showing how Madison seems to be emblematic of what's going on with our young people. And about the reaction to your piece, it's, it's tricky to have a responsible conversation around suicide. Yeah. How do we do that? It's really tough. And that was something I learned in the magazine piece because we, we paired the magazine piece with a video. And I, I'm not, I was not an expert on how to talk about suicide, how to write about suicide, how to think about it on a one-to-one -one level or on a mass level. And there were mistakes we made in that video piece about our language around how to talk about suicide, whether we're, you know, quote unquote, romanticizing it. So we learned a lot in the aftermath of just talking about that piece. And so moving forward in the book, we, we wanted to make sure we told this story in a way that opened up the conversation, but didn't cause clusters or treat it in an irresponsible manner that young people would now have a game plan, but right. rather they might see parts of themselves in Maddie and open up a better conversation about suicide. And by, when I say that, I mean, one, not making it clinical, being deliberate about how you want to communicate about it, your word choice. And the thing I learned more than anything was being present in conversations with people and not thinking that if I talked about suicide with them, I was planting the seed, just learning so much about it. And once you wrap your mind around all of the information and the smart people who have done work in this space, you realize like you can just be a human being and talk about this and not worry that it's a landmine right. and you're gonna be causing hurt. One of the things that's so tough when you read this story is it seemed like she had the most supportive family, really, really strong relationships with her siblings. Um, when she goes to quit, her college coach does everything right and says everything that you want someone to say in that conversation. So it just makes you think, is there something we all missed in this story? Yeah. That was my pursuit in the beginning, was finding the one thing, was being able to go back and say, that's the moment right there, and I think we want that as humans. We, it would be really nice for me to sit up here and say, yeah, we all missed this one thing. And like answers. Yes, <laughs> here's the one thing, and now we can all rest assured if we avoid that one thing, this one Our daughters be will path. be safe. Exactly. Um, there was not a one thing. There were really important takeaways, one being time. And by that, I mean, in talking to Madison's parents, 
I mean, she had articulated right before going back to school that she had suicidal thoughts. And there was the thing I mentioned before about the myth that if her parents then engaged her on that, or if anyone engaged her on that, it would be further planting that seed as opposed to a conversation that could be in some way rehabilitative or restorative. Um, but her parents kept coming back to this concept of time and saying, the one thing we thought we had in abundance or more of was time, as opposed to looking at a young person's struggles or really anyone's struggles and thinking of it like we might a disease, which is we don't know the time frame. Just because someone is healthy for 18 years as they're growing up and now they're hitting this transition period and that could be the trigger for you know, genetic issues with brain chemical changes, it could be the first time in their life that anxiety and depression does rear its head. That doesn't mean because you had 18 years, all of a sudden you get you know, two to three to fix and figure out how you want to address this, this issue. It just varies widely among people. So that was the one thing, was time and understanding how it works when someone's struggling. Um, and then there was just a, a, a slew of really important takeaways about what's going on with young people. When I say what's going on with young people, I mean the rising rates of anxiety and depression right. among student athletes and reflective in the whole general population of high school and college age kids. I mean, we have an issue going on on our college campuses. And it seems like the smartphone is, is playing some role in that. Yeah. Um, we know that the attitudes and behaviors of teens are changing. They're not rushing to the DMV on their 16th birthday to get their driver's license, which is you know, really foreign to me. Um, you know, they're, they're sleeping more, they're more depressed. How can we have a healthy relationship with technology? Well, I think it's something we're all dealing with, right? <laughs> like certainly the numbers in the studies when we look at our high school and college age kids are frightening about how the screen time is affecting their anxiety and depression. But I think I struggle with it, I deal with it. The best anecdote I can give about what's going on and how we can in some way, and it, it is common sense, is that in the book, um, one, Madison's Instagram feed, which is still live, her mom would look at it when she was at college and say, okay, they knew she was struggling, but, and they would say, well, but look, I looked at you at that party, I, I saw the picture from the football game and you look happy, and Madison would say, mom, that is just a picture. And <laughs> Madison was projecting a life and an ideal experience that was not an accurate reflection of her life, and yet she could not apply that same logic to other people. Right. I don't think that's unique to Madison Holleran. And probably I, not to the wellness world. <laughs> exactly. Um, but the one thing, the one study that really opened my eyes and how I try and use technology and communicate, and I'm not always great about this, was that they looked at young, two, young, two different camps of young people. One of them, when they were struggling, dealing with an emotional issue, would text their loved ones, their mom, let's say, and say, I'm really struggling, mom. And the mom would, of course, text back like, oh, honey, what can I do? I love you. That group, whatever the internal chemical, which I can never remember the name of, that's released when you as a human Oxytocin. being. Oxytocin. There you go. <laughs> um, are soothed was not released in those young people. And I assume it would be any human. On the other hand, when someone was struggling in college and high school, called their mom or saw their mom, I'm just using mom as a proxy sure. here, <laughs> um, that chemical was released. And I think when, if, if, we're, if we're parents of kids or even if we're just friends with people, we think we are in touch with people and we have all this wealth and proliferation of communication, but so little of it now is the kind of meaningful communication that actually develops relationships and helps in situations like Madison Hall. So social media is not a, a substitute for real connections. Yeah, I mean, that's an obvious statement right, <laughs> that we're all dealing with. But the, uh, the added thing was like, I had Madison's computer, I had her iMessages, and that was the thing when I had her computer, and I point down here, it was like on her desktop and her iMessages, and I, and I saved them for the end because it seemed daunting. Yep. Um, I thought they'd be really insightful and they weren't insightful in the way I wanted them to be. Like all of, I wanted them to have all of this communication that explained something, and it wasn't there. But what was eye-opening was that almost all of her text messages that were like, I'm struggling at Penn, I wanna quit, 
all of them were punctuated by emojis. Mm. And I could see in the rereading of them that no matter what the language is, if you punctuate it with like a monkey covering eyes, and I use that because that was a, a very frequent, frequent one, there's no way to interpret that message with the same intensity that you would without the emoji. In an actual and conversation. There is no monkey covering eyes in person. Right. There just is none. And so I can see how the recipients of all of those messages saw the LOL, the ha ha ha, all of the emojis, and were like, that softens everything. For sure. Um, so you talked a little bit about Instagram, and, and that was one of Maddie's um, social media platforms of choice. And you know, there is this you know, perfection, whether it's with young girls, to be, to be perfect and this achievement-oriented culture. You know, I feel it already with a seventh-month-old in Brooklyn and there's pressure what to get... What exactly are you doing to make that perfect? <laughs> we're, we're not quite on that yet, but, you know, pressure to get into the right twos Ooh, program right. and preschool, you know, our neighborhood. Um, so how, how can we raise people and, and live as humans, um, you know, seeking joy and intrinsic validation instead of um, perfection and achievement? Yeah. Well, if we start on the perfection, I want to break that down a little bit more because um, one of the issues with Madison was the fact that track and field and cross country, not her first love of a sport, soccer being her first love, soccer got her into Lehigh on a scholarship. But then when she got better at track, track opened the door to an Ivy League. And in talking to all of her friends and family, there was some sense in Madison's mind that that Penn, Ivy League, Philly, track and field was not the passion and love, but it was what the society right would validate more. And so that directed the choice to Penn, which is all wrapped up in how we're checking boxes with our kids. Yep. And it's all about the perception of where you're going as opposed to truly fueling intrinsic, you know, passion. Um, that's running rampant. I don't, obviously, if I had a solution for that, I'd probably you know, give like an hour long presentation on it. I don't. There's a quote that we have in the book. It's not my quote. It's from a New York City pastor who has passed away. And this was in the 90s. And he gave a sermon called The Art um, of Perfection. And he didn't mean it as an art, right? And he has this quote where he says, notice how close perfection is to despair. Mm -hmm. And that, when I saw that quote and like thought about, all, I mean, everybody has some element of that um, as it came to Madison, it just is completely applicable. And for your original question, like how do we, you know, raise human beings who don't get funneled, right? Right. Um, I don't know, I used to say all the time, I don't have kids, we don't have kids, my girlfriend and I, Catherine, she's over there. Um, <laughs> We don't have kids, but I always used to say, <laughs> um, I always used to be like, I don't care, it was always sport. I don't care what sport they're great at, but like as long as they're great at a sport. Right. And then maybe I was like, well, I don't wanna, I don't necessarily need to have them be an athlete. And I was like, I don't care what they're great at, as long as they're great at something. And after working on this book, I was like, maybe I just want a great human. And uh, more than that, uh, when did competent become like a pejorative, you know, <laughs> just like, be and mediocrity being a, a word that we would all never even touch. Right. Like, why can't it be okay to just be a good human and like be good at what you do as opposed to have to be like the best all of the time? So I've tried to reframe for when we do have kids, like what that language looks like. And if you could talk to Maddie today, what would you tell her? Um, I, will s I would tell her to stay. And that's, I'm stealing that line from To Write Love on Her Arms, which is a fantastic campaign and, and nonprofit that does work in the community with, with young people that works with musicians and athletes and, and tries to make this conversation cool. Because that's part of the issue is like even Madison, when she was preparing to go back for her second semester and thought she would be able to quit, she could never follow through on quitting. And quitting is a separate discussion about our culture and this concept of quitting. Um, she was looking up all of these clubs at Penn for what she might do with her time. And she looked up, you know, like Penn Fashion Collective and theater. And one of them was Active Minds, which was the campus's organization addressing mental health. But when she would tell her friends about what clubs she had looked up, she did not mention Active Minds. And I think 
organizations like Two Right Love on Our Arms that are trying to make bring this conversation to young people where they are instead of taking young people and bringing them to a more like clinical cold place is such crucial work. And so for Maddie, I, I, that's a place I think she would have connected with to think I'm not alone. And there, the long short of it is that the 10th, September 10th is World Suicide Prevention Day and their campaign is stay. Stay and find out what you were made for. And that's what I would tell her. Thanks so much, Kate. Thanks, Colleen. Thank you guys. Yeah.